Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Ebune. Tonight, we are out. Those are the words of U.S. President Donald Trump a few months ago, announcing a potential American withdrawal from the Paris Climate Change Deal, which was a document signed by at least 194 countries in the French capital back in 2015. The declaration itself delivered from the White House created a lot of agitation around the world. The European Union said it was not a turning back. So was China, Russia, and other big emitters around the world. What was the reaction from Africa? Well, not quite different as climate change increasingly becomes a national security issue. Science says we need to keep global temperatures at at least 2% if we need to live peacefully in the world. A simple question with a clear answer tonight. What will be the potential fallout on Africa of an American withdrawal from the Paris climate change deal? Dr. Richard Munan, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much, Charles, for having me. You are the Mr. Africa of the United Nations Environment Program. Where were you precisely when President Donald Trump announced from the White House that the United States of America will be quitting the Paris climate change deal uh, intended to safeguard humanity from rising temperatures? Thank you very much, Charles, for this question. Uh, we're living in very unprecedented times, and I was actually uh, in Nairobi at the UN Environment Headquarters when this announcement was made. But what needs to be put in perspective is what, 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 that... What, what was your immediate reaction when you heard that announcement? How did you react? Well, my reaction as well as the world's reaction was same because the science is unequivocally clear that the world needs more actions and not less and climate change is a global responsibility and every nation have a stake to be part and parcel of actions that can be were you shocked change. were you taken aback were you surprised were you frightful what was your mood well i wasn't frightful because what is happening in the world today from the scientific perspective the world's actions are still short of where we're supposed to actually keep dangerous climate change at bay and therefore even the united states pulling out or even if the united states was still there there is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that the world can actually stay off the two degrees centigrade dangerous mark the German Chancellor said that um, there will be no turning back to the Paris climate change deal. President uh, Emmanuel Macron of France said that let us make the world great again by respecting the crime Paris climate change deal. Uh, that was a reaction globally. What have you been hearing from African governments as their main reaction to this uh, announcement from the White House? The African continent is already showing leadership. Before the adoption of the Paris Agreement, there was what was called the intended national determined contributions. And what this means in the layman's language is actually plans put in place by each an African country to implement so that climate resilience can be built. Even if drought, drought strike or even if there is sea level rise, we can be able to adapt. And as we are speaking today, the Paris Agreement has been ratified by more than 37 African countries, almost about 70%. And no other continent in the world have actually ratified at the speed in which Africa is ratifying this Paris Agreement. So in a nutshell, Africa have actually recognized the opportunities inherent in this Paris Agreement, and they are ratifying this because climate action is not a burden. It is an opportunity. Why, why do you think that African countries are ratifying rapidly the 
Paris climate change deal. In other words, can you paint a picture of the climate change situation in Africa for me? As we're speaking today, in 2015, the UN environment came out with a report called the Africa Adaptation Gap Report. And the statistics were scary. The African continent, as we're currently speaking, will weakness up to about 40% reduction in crop yields in staples that will all depend on maize, sorghum, beans. And as a result of this decline in crop production because of the changing climate, the worst is that, as we're speaking today, the world the world's temperature is 1.1 degree. And the dangerous temperature in which the world has actually put from the scientific perspective is 1.5 degrees. So we are short 0.4 degrees to reach 1.5 degrees. And that is what the Paris Agreement intend to achieve. But the dangerous climate change of 2 degrees, we are then 0 0.9 degrees away to hitting 2 degrees. And that will mean that there will be crop failure in the African continent. There will be sea level rise in the African continent, displacing millions of people, especially Cameroon will see up to about 2 million people displaced as a result of sea level rise, which is going to be 14 percent higher than the global mean in the entire African continent. What we are also saying is that if climate action, which African countries have captured in their national determined contribution, focusing in areas that can be able to address poverty, like agriculture, and clean energy, like the sun, which they've all captured in this, their national intended determined contribution, which because they've ratified that this has become national determined contribution, if they focus to invest in these areas, using actions that can build climate resilience. They will create jobs, especially to the youth who are unemployed today at 60% across the continent. Uh, this is what Mike Brun from American environmentalist called the Sierra Club said just after President Donald Trump announced a withdrawal of the United States from the Paris climate change uh, deal. He said, quote, it was a historic mistake which our grandchildren we look back on with stunned dismay at how a world leader could be so divorced from reality and morality. What will be the financial fallout, for instance, and leadership fallout on Africa of a United States withdrawal from the Paris climate change deal? When I started off, Charles, I said, climate action is a global responsibility and the science is unequivocally clear but across the entire world Africa is the most vulnerable continent and the science has established that and today as we are speaking there are 25 million people who are suffering in the eastern part of Africa as a result of drought as we're speaking today there are people in the Sahel who are suffering as a result of drought and therefore climate change is no longer an abstract issue it's no longer a long distance issue it is here with us today. And because it is here with us today, we are not only seeing it happening, but we are seeing the implications. As we're speaking, there are so many youthful Africans who are buried under the Mediterranean Sea because they are being driven away, not because there are wars in the countries in which they're living. They're living because there are lack of jobs. They're living because there, are, there is poverty in enormous proportions. And because of this, climate action invested in areas that can be able to create jobs in what we call catalytic sectors which have been established both practically and even from an empirical perspective and scientifically the agricultural sector and the energy sector is the area that can be invested in there was an expected 100 billion dollar a yearly contribution from developed countries to developing countries in which africa is found for the climate change fund, for them for adaptation. When the United States, when the United States says goodbye, how much was expected to come from the United States, and how much will Africa be losing in that for their adaptation policies? The enormity of climate change needs huge sums of money, and before Paris, there is what is called the Green Climate Fund. And before the Paris Agreement, the world has pledged to contribute up to 100 billion U.S. dollars by 2020. But before the United States pulled out, there was 
in that green climate fund coffers it was only 10.1 billion and the united states pulling out means that even if they were still there the 100 billion mark was still short of about 90 billion and africa as i indicated the report in 2015 called the africa adaptation gap report shows that africa will need 50 billion 50 billion and only 10.1 billion in the green climate change fund means that even if the united states contribution into that which was inclusive of the pledges that they have put to be 10.1 billion means that africa still needs 40 billion so with or without the united states africa needs to look for alternative sources of funding because what has been capitalized within the gcf what is called the green climate fund is not enough to build climate resilience and actually protect the citizens of the continent to be climate proof global climate uh, carbon emissions from the United States of America are roughly 15% globally and Africa contributes the least in greenhouse emissions uh, worldwide. When it comes to transfer of technology with the huge technological advances from the United States, what will we be losing, United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Change, Michael Bloomberg? Uh, decided to offer 15 million dollars to fill the American gap. Would that be sufficient without the American moral authority? Every country is just as crucial, whether it is a big country or a small country, in building climate resilience, in taking climate action. A small country in Africa is just as important as a big country in Europe or as United States or even Asia. And the point I'm trying to make here and to put things in perspective is that despite the fact that Africa has contributed very little to the changing climate, to the emissions in the atmosphere today, it is facing a huge burden as a result of the changing climate, but no country in the world is immune. The United States will suffer the same impact in magnitudes as Africa will suffer but the lack of capacity building or the capacity enhancement of the Western world and the least developed world, despite the difference, the impact in terms of climate change refugees, as I mentioned, you drowning in the Mediterranean, being forced as a result of climatic stress or climatic conditions because they cannot farm because of drought, are actually not only going to have impact in, for the African continent, we will also have an impact in, in Western countries. And therefore, climate change should be seen as a national security issue. And just as national security is given prominence, climate action should also be given prominence. And more importantly, to the aspect of technology transfer, Africa is endowed with huge abundance of natural resources, especially energy abundance. As we're speaking today, the African continent, the amount of sunshine just in Northern Africa could light the entire Europe. And the amount of sunshine, for example, here in Cameroon per year, the number of hours of sunshine per year for Cameroon is 2,213 hours of sunshine per year. And across the African continent, this enormous amount of sunshine could ge generate energy to be provided to every household. And more so when you even take hydro energy, Africa have potential of about 1,852 terawatts, which is three times more than the amount of energy that Africa needs per year. But the amount of energy utilized by the entire African continent is equivalent to the amount of energy utilized by the entire country like Spain. That means that the climate change debate, in as much as it is also taking into consideration the common but differentiated principle, which is equity involved that those who have emitted more should actually be able to support the least developed countries which is very valid it is also important to start looking at opportunities that are inherent within climate action how do we address the 625 million africans who are energy impoverished and 600,000 africans who are dying as a result of energy insecurity and depending on biomass on kerosene and that is costing them 20 times the amount of energy that is used by a household in the Western world, for example, the United States. Seven of the ten most threatened countries in the world by climate change 
are in Africa. I'm thinking of the Seychelles Islands, the Mauritius Islands in particular. How can the American withdrawers serve as an opportunity for them to redefine their national security equation, which, of course, is that of existence? Because if nothing is not done, probably we'll be heading to countries that will completely be submerged or disappear completely. You know the situation of the Lake Chad Basin. Absolutely. Climate change leadership has been taken up by countries like China, by the European Union, and also Africa, based on the ratification rate of the Paris Agreement that I mentioned. China is investing up to about 400 billion in clean technology. The European Union, following the withdrawal of the United States, is ratcheting up the ambition and investing in clean energy, which is going to create more decent jobs, which is going to create well-paid jobs. But more so from a security perspective, no country is immune. And the fact that the seven most vulnerable countries are found in the African continent today is testament to the fact that climate change is a security issue. When a country is submerged as a result of sea level rise, which is going to be 14% higher than the global mean, people will be rushing to countries that are not their own and sinking sanctuaries in countries not their own. That causes a security issue. And they will not only be rushing to countries in the African continent, they will be rushing to countries across other continents, like Europe and even the United States, that causes a security issue. And therefore, from a security perspective, as I indicated earlier, climate change needs to be given the same prominence as the security issue is given prominence across the entire world today. So climate action is actually an opportunity to address some of the security challenges that are facing the world today. What kind of plan B for climate change survival uh, policymakers like you and institutions like the United Nations Environment Program preparing already in a world where the American leadership, which you guys counted so much to support, is um, saying we are not part of it. Article 5 of the Paris Agreement on Equivocally states clearly that climate action should engage both state and non-state actors. That includes you and me, that includes individual citizens, that includes the private sector, that includes non-governmental organization, that includes civil societies, that includes policy makers, that includes international development organization, that includes faith-based organization and community-based organization. Inclusivity, inclusive partnership, it's a very crucial determining aspect in terms of implementation of the Paris Agreement. And what the UN environment in collaboration with sister UN agencies and in collaboration with governments and with citizens and with stakeholders including NGO civil society are doing is engaging everyone because everyone's skills matter. Climate action is not just a matter are of you government. Building partnership with private ent entities, institutions, individuals. Are there concrete examples to prove that partnership today? Absolutely right here in Cameroon. There is what is called EPAFOSA, which is Ecosystem Based Adaptation for Food Security Assembly. What this means is that inclusivity, bringing everyone on board and using his or her skills towards ensuring that the sectors that, the con that can be able to address poverty and build climate resilience, like agriculture, like clean energy, brought together and bringing people in the entire agro value chain can be able to create jobs. And Cameroon is actually leading on this Ebafosa, which is not only helping to reshape the narrative that you could be able to build climate resilience by building on people's skills, by enhancing their partnerships, by ensuring their networks. But you, if you focus on these catalytic sectors of agriculture and clean energy and expand the entire agro value chain, which means that if you are adding value to what is produced and connecting to markets using information communication technology, because I was speaking today, three quarter of the country, everyone have access to a mobile phone. What, 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 you, you have repeatedly uh, cited the agricultural sector. Just how valuable is it in Africa in reshaping the climate change discourse, for example? Very crucial. The intended national determinations 
determined uh, the intended national determined contribution that I mentioned earlier, which now has become national determined contributions. Sixty-five percent of the actions are land-based and this is agricultural. And the second most important is energy. So the sixty-five percent, which is land-based, and taking into consideration that sixty-five percent of the uncultivated land in the world is in the African continent, and more so. 64% or more of the workforce in the entire continent is employed in the agricultural sector. And the agricultural sector is the only sector that can reduce poverty two to four times more than any sector. Manufacturing wouldn't do that. Tourism wouldn't do that. And an increase of 10% in the agricultural sector have potential to reduce poverty by 7%. But what the science and practical evidence has also shown is that when you work with nature, meaning that not destroying the environment, using approaches that are helping to make the soil still be intact, to make the forest to provide the services that they provide, whether it is the water towers, you could be able to increase agricultural yields up to 128%, but that is not enough. If you bring in clean energy, which is actually a climate action to add value, processing, drying vegetables that have been produced, you could be able to create up to about 17 million jobs, especially for the youth, and more so, the agricultural sector is the only sector that has an agro-economy worth one trillion US dollars in less than 13 years. If you want to create jobs for the 60% unemployed youth, it is agriculture, but agriculture done differently, and that is what Ebabosa you know, is promoting. But, but, but you know that that agricultural policy will entail deforestation, will entail uh, destruction, erosion, and whatsoever. How should agriculture be done in a climate change environment? Very simple and it's already happening. What is happening now is not new. But the problem of agriculture is that it's been done in silos. The problems of agriculture will not necessarily only be solved by the Ministry of Agriculture, they will be solved by the Ministry of Telecommunication also. The problems of agriculture will not be solved by the Ministry of Agriculture, only will also be solved by the Ministry of Environment. The problems of agriculture will not only be solved by the Minister of Agriculture, it will also be solved by the Minister of Finance. And what this means is that the approaches that are practical, a mother in a village who till the soil, plant beans and, 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 and corn, also needs incentives so that the approach that is his, she's not destroying the soil or destroying the forest, incentives from the perspective of using that approach so that you can be able to assess inputs and these inputs could be financial inputs whereby they, they, they need to be also connection to markets so that what she produces she can add value to it if it is vegetable can she dry those vegetables in such a way that she can preserve them because as we're speaking today 48 billion U US dollars has been lost as a result of post harvest losses and because That's of this in Africa alone, in Africa alone but Africa is spending 35 billion US dollars importing food. And that is actually exporting employment and importing unemployment. Because that money, 35 billion US dollars, could have been used to purchase what is produced in the African continent today. And that will create jobs. But more so, the continent of Africa today is 20 times less productive than the developed world. Why? Because value addition into what is produced is almost nil. Let and therefore, Ibafosa is helping to address this gap. A lot of scientific evidence you provide to back uh, the climate change existence philosophy and why people should follow your line of reasoning and many others around the world. But you guys have been unable to convince the Trump administration that climate change is real that it is a threat to every communities across the world. Explain to me why do you think that it is a dichotomy between the scientific world and the Donald Trump administration for them to accept that climate change is a reality? On a scale, those who are convinced are more than those who are not convinced. And if you take the United States, for example, most, as you indicated, most of the states have actually passed laws that are climate friendly. If you take California, the governor of California just two weeks ago passed a bill that will actually see California cut emissions by up to about 20%. And more so, 
most of the private sector in the United States, if you take Google, they are powering their operations using solar energy. That is climate action. If you take Apple, they are powering their operations now and even gearing up to power all their operations by 100% using solar energy. All of that has not that succeeded to convince Donald Trump that he needs to back the Paris climate change deal. It, that has not convinced the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, that we are all supposed to do this. Why? What I am saying is, if you look at the United States as a country, there is the federal government that is in denial. But the citizens of the United States, three quarter of them, and even the states in the United States, are actually following what the science is telling us. Because they are seeing climate change as an opportunity and as a business investment, not as a burden. The pool ad has not actually been triggered because according to the Paris Agreement, Article 25, 27, it takes four years to actually pull out of the climate agreement. And though this was a political signal, the process to be able to pull out of the Paris Agreement will actually happen in November 2020. The Africa Regional Coordinator for Climate Change Policy at the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi, Kenya, Dr. Richard Muna, thank you very much indeed for being guest on Global Watch. Thank you for having me, Charles. You're Always welcome. a pleasure. You're welcome. Appreciate it.